Hello and welcome to In Control, the first podcast on control theory. Here we discuss the science of feedback, decision making, artificial intelligence, and much more. I'm your host, Alberto Padoan, live from a recording studio in Zurich. Quick shout out to our sponsors, the National Center of Competence in Research on Dependable Ubiquitous Automation at ETH Zurich and the International Federation of Automatic Control. Today, we're honored to have a very special guest, John Doyle. He's the Jean-Louis Chameau Professor of Control and Dynamical Systems in the Division of Engineering and Applied Science at Caltech. John is a living legend in control theory. He's made groundbreaking contributions to robust control, decentralized control, and complex network systems. Without further ado, welcome to the show, John. Hi. Today's episode will be the first part of a longer discussion on uh, your journey in control theory. I think we agreed today that we are diving into the seismic shift that control theory experienced in the 70s and 90s, moving away from optimality and into the thrilling world of robustness. I thought that we maybe could start with some incredible stories about the man behind the scientific curtain. While preparing this episode, I found some really incredible stories how did you manage to challenge yourself either through running, cycling or rowing at levels that are essentially world-class while also being a very active researcher? Well, I, I think a theme we're going to hear throughout this is that I've been extremely lucky. Even when, I'm in, when I've been incredibly stupid, I've nevertheless been very, very lucky. And Panama is a good example of that. I just did something incredibly stupid and should not have survived and barely did. But uh, again, I got lucky and was rescued and had actually great medical care in Panama. But also that, that effectively ended my sports activities. I mean, I got damaged enough that I couldn't compete at, the, at a world level, um, which I did do. And that, again, was all luck. I mean, that's just, that was pure genes, not anything other than nothing due to my creativity or brilliance or anything. It's just, I just genetically had an extreme combination of strength and VO2 max. And I didn't realize that when I was younger and I played football and basketball and got injured all the time. And so eventually I figured it out in my thirties and then, and was able to actually win world championships and set world records. But that was, uh, quite late. I should have been doing that younger and not playing, you know, all these team sports and just being hurt all the time. So, but one thing about that is it turns out I have, you know, in this layered architecture story, um, I have a genetically extreme muscular system. I have a genetically extreme cardiovascular system and a genetically extreme nervous system. And I have a very bad skeletal system. And what that means is that you have the ability to do things that your, your body just can't do. So you get hurt a lot. And that, I think, maybe one of my reasons for being interested in robustness might psychologically be that I'm actually extremely fragile. So I break really easily. And so I think, I don't know, how, I don't know if that was the case, but it seems like in retrospect, often you get interested in the things you're so bad at. And so that was one for me. So talking about sports, I've noted down some records that I think it's worth sharing with our audience. So if I am wrong, please correct me. But I've noted down that it in high school, you had a football throw of 65 yards. Yeah, when I was a senior in high school, when I was 17, I was a skinny little kid, but I could throw a football 65 yards, which was, again, entirely due to your nervous system, which is comparable to what NFL players could do. Yeah, exactly. Um, I was just about to say that for context, if you watch the NFL quarterback contest each offseason, you will see quarterbacks hitting, I think, between 58 and 62 yards. Uh, I think that, I think the big, the big strongest quarterbacks can throw 75 consistently. Yeah. So, so, I mean, 65 is good for a high school kid. Um, <laughs> and it would, it would be at the bottom end of, of the pros, but, um, but the problem was, okay, so I'm, I'm a skinny little kid who can, I could throw football 65 yards and I was the fastest player on my team. And so it just turned out, I ended up either running the ball or throwing the ball every play. And we didn't have a good offensive line. And I just got, I got really trashed. I got tons of concussions. 
And we didn't, at the time, we didn't deal with concussions very well. You just kept playing. So again, really, really stupid. Um, and I, I sort of survived the, the football season, but I was pretty beat up and really couldn't play basketball that year very well. So I was pretty much hurt the whole rest of the year. So that was really, again, incredibly stupid. I just, I shouldn't be playing that sport. I mean, I'm, I'm too fragile to be playing football and I'm too fragile to play football and carrying the ball 40 times a game. Is that what has driven your, your shift towards uh, rowing? No, that was just, r rowing was just an accident. I've seen that you've set multiple world record, yeah. all, I think, in your 40s or something at a senior level. Yeah, well, that, that's, but those were age mm -hmm. group records. So those were for over 40. And again, the rowing was a total accident. I was going to the World Masters Games in Brisbane, which is kind of the Olympics for old people. And I was going to do... Uh, cycling, track and field, and triathlon. And then, of course, I got hurt and couldn't really run. And so I had two weeks. So the one event was at the beginning and the other was at the end of two weeks. So I had this, you know, intermediate two weeks. And I was looking around at what I might do while I was in Brisbane. So it just, again, just lucky. There was in my class as a, a graduate student who was on the U.S. national rowing team. And so I asked him about rowing. He goes, oh, yeah, it's all the records and all the competitions. A lot of the competitions are actually on machines because the water is too unpredictable. So you do have water, but you have a lot of events that are just machines. And I said, oh, maybe I could do that. So he said, it's, he says it's trivial to learn, which is true. Uh, no skill involved. And it's basically a VO2 max test. And so I tried it. And like the second time... I tried it. I broke, I broke the existing world record. <laughs> so it wasn't a skill event at all. This is incredible. <laughs> so, so I, I decided I'd do that at this world master games. And the thing that was exciting about it was there was a former Olympic gold medalist from Hungary who, who was, you know, kind of making his comeback in his forties. And so, you know, their national TV was there and everything. And of course, expecting him to win and, Nobody had ever heard of me because I never rode before. And so I beat him and set, set new world records. Uh, um, so that was just, again, but that's just, you know, that's basically genetics. I mean, it's a VO2 max test. That's almost entirely genetics. And I was in good shape. I was in good shape for the other events. I just couldn't run, but I could row. And so, so yeah, I got two gold medals in that. I, I took a fourth in the cycling and sixth in the triathlon. The triathlon was really bad because I, I really couldn't, do the run very well at the end so that's incredible because you were also an active professor at the time oh yeah and i i went to i mean i spent a long time in australia because i did a sort of a lecture tour around this event so it was a it was a blast but uh but again just complete luck right i mean i had not planned to do rowing i didn't think of rowing as something i could do right and it just turned out again very lucky that i was able to do it and it, it requires no skill And also doesn't require running. Um, it's just a pure, just a pure VO max, basically a pure VO2 max test. So anyway, again, mostly lucky. Uh, the, I, th I think the most exciting actually event ever was the human powered vehicle world championships it was not age group. It was, it was open. And Andy Packard was the academic advisor for the Berkeley team that went to that. And I went as a spectator because they had the national champion cycling team. So they had the best riders, right? You know, they had fabulous riders. And it just turned out, again, the, the one-hour time trial, I probably had the best for this bike. In this, this bike, I probably had the best time. I, I, or they projected I would have the best time. So they let me ride the one-hour time trial because nobody wanted to do that anyway. It's just incredibly painful. And, uh, and we won that. And so, uh, so that was a fun thing I did with Andy. And, uh, but it's these very exotic vehicles. They're all fully fared even in this is 94, maybe, um, fully fared, you know, they go 65 miles an hour top speed. So it was really fun, but that was also, again, just complete accident. So a lot of these things look, you know, like they're systematically and I, you know, I won world championships, but they're very idiosyncratic and, and a lot of luck. I think talking about luck, we must talk about your Panamanian adventure. I noted down a list of facts and again, please correct me if I'm wrong. So You're on holiday in Panama with your wife, and that's August 26, 2007. 
you decide to go for a run on a trail in El Valle and you were supposed to be back at 5 p.m. So expecting an easy to moderate two and a half hours loop. However, you disappear in the mountains of Panama around 5 p.m. So on the way to the peak, you basically reach the peak around 4 p.m., I think. Yeah. You damage your, your hand, you cut your hand on the way up. And then as you decide to go another path, essentially, you, you choose to go for another path that is not the original path, you slide down a cliff. Yeah, that's basically it. Yeah. Again, r really stupid. Like, really, really stupid. So you're officially declared missing by 7 p.m. So it's, I, I believe it was probably dark. Yeah. It starts to rain, it's foggy. And so rescue operations start. So you are injured. I think. Uh, I read somewhere that you lost something like a quarter of your blood. A third. A third. Holy. And so, but you were conscious, right? I think, yeah. I mean, I thought I was, but I was there for two days before they got to me. Yeah. So the, the rescue operations had to stop at some point because uh, it was rainy, foggy. So you were trying to shout and asking for help, but yeah. you're deep in yeah. the forest yeah. of Panama. and Yeah. I fell off about a 10 meter cliff. Uh, which was very rocky, and I just shredded everything. I, I was probably hours from dying at the point they got me because I was septic and had lost a lot of blood. And I broke four vertebrae in my back, which was pretty debilitating. But I didn't break anything else, so which was a miracle. So I could move around a little bit, and I tried to get in a place where they could see me. But it was just, I mean, epic stupidity. And the medical care I got was astonishing. It was a new hospital. They were trying to set this up as a destination medical facility. And my wife is a very famous physician and they were trying to impress her, <laughs> which they did. It was, it was just first rate medicine the whole way through. And that, I think that made a big difference, but the orthopedic surgeon who treated me <laughs> had fallen in the same place, not as badly as me. But it turns out we were both using the same guidebook and the guidebook was wrong. And it, it showed a, a trail that really wasn't there. And he had followed the same guidebook and fall, <laughs> fallen in the same place. So it was like, oh, it was so a lot of weirdness about it. But. And how did the rescue actually happen? Because you were there, as you said, one or even two days. Uh, two days. So you were not eating, you were... Yeah, so there was, you know, there was a crew out looking for me and they... they I mean, they didn't know very well where I was, but, um, but I was, I, I got myself in a position where I was visible in, across the whole valley. So once they sort of started looking at that, that side of the valley, I don't think it took them too long to find me. It was just hard to get me out, but they, I think they, once they figured out where I was kind of roughly, they were able to find me. But again, it took a couple of days. Incredible. Incredible. <laughs> And, and again, it seems like oh. luck played a, a huge role also in this context. Oh God. No, again, I, I think, I think the theme is I was really stupid and really lucky. <laughs> so I, I, I've, you know, I've kind of, I would say that's a lot of my career too, uh, but being really, really lucky. Yeah, maybe this is a good time actually to move towards, uh, what we promised to deliver today. So talking about the inception of your career, the start of your career, and basically, I'd like you to take us through the, I would say, the golden age almost of, of robustness, in a sense. So from the 70s to the 80s, all the way to the 90s. So you studied at MIT, is that correct? And you started in 1976? No, I graduated. In, I mean, well, I should have graduated in 76. So what happened was I... Um, I did my mass, I did my bachelor's thesis. Oh, and let me just say one thing, which is I'm going to whine a lot and complain a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but overall, the professors at MIT treated me really, really well. So, and I hated MIT, but it was a lot because, again, I was hurt all the time. I was playing basketball. And so I just, just had a bad basketball career there. So, so I, I and I blamed the gym and the facilities and stuff, which was legitimate, but but uh, it was mostly, again, me. I was just, I'm just very fragile. I shouldn't play basketball. Um, what role were you playing in basketball, if I may ask? As a principal, I was a point guard, but um, 
And again, this is a weird thing, which was I was a really good one-on-one player. I could play one-on-one. I played one-on-one with NBA players, and I can hold my own. But this is Division Three. I mean, this is the lowest low end of basketball in college, right? And I was just not very good. I was very frustrating for the coach because, again, I looked. I it seemed like I should be good, but I was. I think it was mostly I was kind of stupid, and I have I had some damaged peripheral vision from all the concussions, so. I just wasn't a good five on five basketball player. And so, and I was, again, I was hurt all the time and some players can play hurt, but if you're relying on, you know, just pure quickness and athleticism and not skill, then if you get hurt, you're, you're stuck. So I had a miserable career. I had one good, like one good game when I was there. So, um, but you know, I will complain about MIT. I was actually treated pretty well. So just keep that in mind as I whine. I, I was I was wondering how did you end up at MIT? Oh, I was just the best place I thought at the time. I mean, it wasn't wasn't I I, I visited a lot of schools and stuff and decided to go there. So, and from the sixties to to the seventies, I think the shift, at least in control theory, was from first of all, I guess in the sixties there was a shift from classical control to the state space paradigm motivated by aerospace. Yes. Questions, yes. yes. But then again, in, in the seventies, there was sort of a shift back towards robustness. Yeah, I can tell you. I mean, I can tell you what I did in that role. So, um, in spring of nineteen seventy six, I did my bachelor's thesis uh, with Neil Sandel, who was just tr- he was wonderful. I mean, as an advisor, he was it couldn't have been better. And the idea was, I had been taking all these controls courses, but I hadn't really tried to apply them to something serious. And so this was an attempt to apply them to control of synchronous machines. And so even then we were thinking about, you know, a future smart grid. And the idea would be, we would want to do more sophisticated control at the generator side. And so, and it was pretty naive, but the idea is we, Fred Schweppe had a little generator actually in at MIT that they could connect to the grid. And so they had models for this and all sorts of stuff. So I, I figured I would just do a theoretical project on designing a controller for one of these synchronous machines. And I was going to apply, you know, LQG and all, you know, various variants of LQG and stuff like that. And, and I found out that at least the two big, the two big ideas that currently dominated how people thought about robustness was two things. One was it was okay to check margins one loop at a time. So if you had multiple uncertainties, you would check them one at a time and then hope that combinations didn't kill you. But nobody thought systematically about that problem. I was, and I, I discovered that in fact that was false, that you could, you could be arbitrarily bad and not notice it through a loop at a time. So that was, that was, and that came out of kind of the classical world. And there was even a, a mil spec, it was called a military specification for airplanes, which was loop at a time for robustness. Um, now, most of the designs at the time were loop at a time, but that didn't mean the robustness could be done loop at a time. So that was one issue. And the other was, if you used LQG, you would have guaranteed margins that you didn't have to check all these things. And again, that also was false. But, but there was a, the state feedback case was, was true. And the idea was, oh, there's all these separation theorems. Surely there's a separation theorem of robustness. And it turns out there weren't, wasn't. So I kind of figured that out in, in 1976. But what I had was numerical examples. And this meant you know, submit a card deck, you know, get a printout the next day that say you had a syntax error and you'd spend a week just getting rid of the syntax errors. And you'd finally get the result back and you'd get back results which were like ter- you know, terrible, terrible margins, but not zero. But you could tweak the and make them arbitrarily small. So you have these numerical examples. But you know, again, I'm, it's like I'm telling you, like the old days when I was a kid, right, kind of thing. But there wasn't any. It was very hard to uh, to put into a paper these kind of numerical results, and there wasn't any place people would go to download it or anything. I mean, this was very you know, sort of primitive days, and so I knew these things were wrong. But I knew also that if I was going to, you know, torpedo the field like this, it had to be transparent. It had to be analytic in a sense. And that was, <laughs> in retrospect, it should have been trivial, but it wasn't. I, I struggled. And I was, 
also I, I, you know, I got distracted by other things. But then the big thing was I spent the summer of 1976 at Honeywell. And that changed everything for me. Because everything I told them, they just ate up. I mean, and they had, uh, they, they had this, this spectrum of engineers from all the way from the people in the trenches who were actually designing the flight control systems for all the major aerospace problems. And I got to talk to them all the way to a research group that was, I think, the best in the world at the time. And so I got plopped into there as sort of a resident theoretician. And, I, and they were starting to try to use LQG. And I told them they shouldn't. And here's why. And they were all, I mean, they were on that right away. I mean, they, you know, totally everything about it. They loved, I, I got treated extremely well, but also I got really strong reinforcement for the direction I was going in, right. Which was in contrast to what academics, I mean, the academic reaction was extremely hostile. So, and the other thing that happened in 76 was I went to my first conference, which was the joint automatic control conference, which is now ACC. And the hot topic there was multivariable control. So how to generalize whatever, you know, state space or classical or whatever to multivariable systems. And there was a whole bunch of competing methods, right? So not, there wasn't just LQG. There was a whole other inverse Nyquist array, characteristic loci, eigenstructure assignment. And you'd go from one session to another. And the big argument was between these methods, right? So they would say, oh, I'm better LQG or, you know, so it was, and it was interesting. It was no one was kind of questioning the, uh, the loop at a time idea and nobody knew that LQG didn't have guaranteed margins. So again, I was pretty shocked. So I, I came back from that and, you know, we generated counterexamples to everything, but the only LQG and, and loop at a time was on my front burner. But again, I still had numerical examples. So then I went back to MIT for another year because I hadn't actually graduated. I, I had basketball eligibility left and stuff, but I had an NSF fellowship. So I was, I was really skirting the boundaries of what was allowed, but, um, but NSF fellowship. So I went back and got a master's degree and a bachelor's degree. So at the end of 77, I had both. And I did a master's thesis. And that was also an adventure. Um, with Sanjoy Mitter, again, who was, oh, I mean, he, again, I can't say how much, how nice he was and how, how great he was. So I, my, both, both my bachelor's thesis and my master's thesis there were, my advisors were just great. It's just that the consequences of both of them was, uh, disruptive to say the least. So, but my master's thesis was in information theory, which I hadn't even had any courses in, but it was, kind of overlapped with the, the, the ideas of robustness and stuff that I was already working on. And so Sanjoy said, here, here's a PhD thesis. Maybe there's some extensions to it. And it turned out the PhD thesis and again, and the transactions and information theory paper that came out of it were, were wrong. And it turned out the problem was kind of trivial. Um, so, uh, what was the problem, if I may ask? It was how to use a rate distortion theory to do reduced order filtering. I, I didn't know any rate distortion theory, but it wasn't hard to learn. And it was just, the thesis was just wrong. And it turned out the problem wasn't very interesting. So I ended up solving the problem correctly. And again, it was the shortest, it turned out to be the shortest master's thesis ever at MIT. It was like 20 pages or something. And I would not have gotten a master's thesis for that, except for the fact that they had just given a PhD to doing the same problem wrong. And so the committee was kind of like, ah, uh, like, what do we do about this? Cause this, re we all agree that this was not worth a master's thesis. And what I said, okay, look, uh, here's the deal. Uh, we'll just quietly do this. Um, and for a long time, you couldn't even get at, I mean, if you tried to download this from MIT, they, they would say errors and stuff. You couldn't get the thesis. Now you can't, I can't go get the thesis out. Um, we sort of agreed that they'd let me go if I just dropped it, right? Don't publish. No, I said, I don't care. I'm not going to publish this. So, so I, I got other, but again, it's, I think it's the shortest master's thesis ever still, which I don't know, kind of set a theme for you know, like short, short theses, short abstracts. But, but then, then I went back to Honeywell in the summer of 77 and set about to really nail down these, all these counterexamples 
in a way that was, you know, could do it analytically. Um, but also, again, I got this kind of feedback from the engineers at Honeywell. And I remember talking to this guy who was one of the real gurus. And I was explaining to him that I was developing a measure of multivariable margins, which was this mu structure standard value story. And he, he goes, he goes, you know, that's fine, but it looks to me like you can solve a much more relevant problem, which is we were, you know, and if it's a single output system, it's okay to reflect all the uncertainty to one place more or less and think of it as so templates in a um, Nichols chart or templates in a Nyquist diagram or something. He said, but that's not what we really want to do. We want to model the uncertainty where we think it is. And that's all over the place and highly structured. And that was like, I mean, I'd been thinking about that, but it wasn't front burner. And I go, yeah, that's the thing we should be doing. So we first have to make a counterexample, but then we have to say, okay, put the uncertainty where it is. Don't reflect it to where you, th where it's convenient, put it where it is. And that's really motivated all the structure singular value work, right? So it seems to me that the spirit of the time essentially was very well reflected by something that I saw Gunter Stein place at the end of his bio. So he was saying something like his research interests are to make modern control theoretical methods work. And it seems to me that it was a huge gap between academia and industry. Yeah. So incidentally, do you think this is the, the case also today? Uh, yeah, but in a completely, I think in a very different direction. So we'll maybe get to that. But Gunter was maybe the biggest influence on me. I mean, proximal. Then there was, you know, there's people like Zames who was a huge influence, but my collab, I mean, I didn't write a paper with an American academic until I was a professor and wrote things with my students, like Andy Packard. When I wrote a paper, I wrote a paper with Andy Packard when he was a professor at Berkeley, right? So I, I was not working with, there was just, there, there was no one to work with in the US. I mean, no one who would accept my ideas. And so I, which is one reason I got a PhD in pure math was also, at the time, pure math, that was a very exciting. Well, let me, I'll get to that in a minute. But, but the thing that happened in, in 77 was, so I generated these counterexamples, which could be done analytically by hand. And so, so they came out in 70. So two papers. One was the LQG counterexample and, the short, again, the shortest abstract in IEEE. And that, admittedly, that was kind of twisting the knife. I mean, I think people were angry at me, not just for those papers. Well, effectively, you with that paper, you were saying, yeah, you were saying that not only LQG is wrong, but the whole frontier of control at that time was wrong. It was wrong, yeah. Just for context for, for our audience, this is a paper that has been published on IEEE transactions. Uh, it's called Guaranteed Margins for LQG Regulators. And it's famously, I believe, the shortest abstract in IEEE papers. Yeah, uh, apparently all of IEEE. All of yeah. IEEE, yeah. Yes. And so the thing was that the title was an expected title. And in fact, I think people expected me to write a paper with that title, which proved that there were guaranteed margins. And so, it, it, again, it was twisting the knife. I probably didn't need to be, I didn't need to do it like that. But anyway, I was, I was having fun. Um, uh, could you uh, elaborate on the, on the contents of, of the paper? Yeah, well, it was just, I just took a really simple, you know, two-dimensional system that you could compute all the Riccati equations and everything. And you could compute basically the gain margin analytically. And I, I showed that um, when you cranked up one of the noises, that margin went to zero. And you could, again, you could check it by hand. So in retrospect, it was kind of trivial and obvious, but it actually took me a while to get something that simple. Again, you you do stuff that was numerical, but th that was just, you know, it, it took me a week to do anything like that. So, and the other thing that happened at the time was we were just starting to understand that there were plants basically with near pole zero cancellations in the right half plane for which no controller would do well. That was a new thing. That was, and Zames was kind of pioneering that stuff. And so... Um, and, and I was aware of that. So I knew I could make up simple examples where no controller would work, but that's not what I wanted. I wanted a system that wasn't like that, that wasn't automatically fragile without, for any control. I wanted one that was, you could find controllers with good margins, 
but LQG specifically would give you bad. That actually, <laughs> that actually took some work. So I, I had to both come up with something that could be, could have good margins and then one, but that LQG would produce bad ones. And I imagine that this also raised some eyebrows at the time. Oh yes, there was, yeah, th it was quite, quite negative reaction. Um, and it wasn't just that all I, I, we had counterexamples to everything. Inverse Nyquist Ray, Kerasitic Lose, Eigenstructure Assignment. I mean, you could place the poles. I mean, now it's trivial, but you could place all the poles way far in the left half plane and it'd be arbitrarily fragile. Um, and again, it's kind of trivial now, but, but at the time it was, it was a shock. Okay. So, um, and, uh, and one of the problems was, you know, MIT kind of dominated the transactions. So you, so, uh, I thought they were trying to stop the paper because, It, it, it looked like they were trying to stop the paper from being published. Um, and it didn't get published until fall of, of 78. So, uh, in, in those days, that was a long time now, like, you know, years and years are just, you know, because it's slow, but it wasn't then. Um, but they weren't, it turns out they weren't actually trying to stop it. They're trying to slow it so that they could get out ahead of that wave. And they, you know, so they were clever and they were out ahead of that wave. And they were, I mean, um, MIT was by far the first place to really embrace all this robustness stuff. They hired Gunter Stein. He came in, he was a half-time adjunct professor. They went all in on robustness. Um, and of course they had really smart graduate students. So they, You know, the, 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 I would say the graduate students there kind of turned on a dime in the sense of, of, of really taking this up quickly. So, so ironically, MIT was the place that was in the U.S. on the really cutting edge of robust control very quickly. Um, so they, didn't, they weren't trying to stop that paper. They just wanted to slow it down so that by the time it hit, they were already, you know, they were ready for the next thing. And in the meantime, you decide to move to Minneapolis, right? Well, I've been living in, I've been, I'd been commuting to Minneapolis in, since 76. Yeah. And, uh, and then 77, I basically, yeah, I moved to Minneapolis. I was, that, that then was my home for the next, you know, six or eight years. Um, and, uh, I didn't see a way for me to do a PhD in the United States. I mean, there just wasn't, I didn't want to go back to MIT and there was just no place that I could find an advisor that was supportive of this direction. Right. And so essentially you end up in Honeywell, which is the largest company at the time, possibly also today and dealing with control systems, right? Well, again, it was a very sweet spot. I don't think it, this exists anymore, but they had both, they both, they had the whole spectrum from, you know, the people who were designing classically loop at a time control systems for real vehicles. And then they had this research group with Gunnar Stein that were trying to take the machinery of modern control, state space methods in particular, and the computational methods that were allowed by state space, but then use them to do designs that the classical guys would find acceptable. And so that was the big push then. Um, and so I was not planning to go to graduate school at that point. I mean, it just seemed futile. And there were starting to be people, you know, outside of the U.S. that were really getting into this quickly. Zames, obviously, was a pioneer, and he'd been pushing this. But then there was mathematicians like Helton, and there was obviously Glover. I was, so Kimura, I mean, there was uh, Bruce Francis. So there was lots of people really jumping on this, but they weren't in the U.S. So I could, I could have maybe done a PhD in Cambridge or whatever. But... But the other thing that happened at the time was there was this real shift to mathematics that had not even considered applied, you know, all this H infinity stuff, right? And that was, again, pioneered by Zames, but he had collaborators, you know, like great mathematicians were getting in on this, right? And so, uh, you know, like people like Tannenbaum, right, who was just a really first-rate mathematician and gotten interested in this through Zames. 
So it looked to me like, um, also there was all sorts of stuff happening in geometric control. There was all sorts of things where new math was coming in. So it looked to me like doing a PhD in math was very attractive. Plus, I believe that also the winter in Minneapolis must have been a convincing factor for you to go to California. Oh, that was, yeah, that sold me. So I spent one winter in Minneapolis, the winter of 77, 78, and it was brutal. You know, 60 days below freezing. The wind chill factor on Christmas Day was, you know, minus 60. I mean, it's just, and I'm, a, I'm, again, I'm very fragile. I do not like cold weather. So then in February, I go, okay, I got to go somewhere warm. I mean, the obvious place to go was California. And it was really, it was really just Stanford or Berkeley. And I had to go in engineering because I had an NSF fellowship and you couldn't switch schools and, and disciplines. I don't know if that's true anymore, but it was true then. So I had to go in engineering. So I had to go talk to the engineers and get admitted, right? Um, and they were, they were pretty wary of me, right? Because I, I already had a reputation and stuff. But it looked like I could get into both places. And, and, but Berkeley had the number one math department in the world at that point. Um, and I thought I might be able to try to do two PhDs or something like that, but I was really, really, I was planning to do a PhD in math, although they didn't know what area, right? I just figured pure math would be a good thing to do. Spend warm winters in Berkeley. Who cares if I get a degree? You know, <laughs> I, so I, I started at Berkeley in 78 and in immediate, I mean, I'll, right away I started taking mostly math classes. I took the, the exams for both math and engineering and I got like a really high score in the math exam and flunked the engineering exam. So, so they kicked me out. I mean, so and I, I, was, I wasn't trying, I mean, I was sort of trying to fail, but it wasn't, I wasn't trying to fail by being just wrong. I was maybe argumentative. I thought their questions were out of date. So the right thing to do is just answer the damn questions, but not argue with them about what the question was. Um, but they were not up on all the latest stuff I thought. And so anyway, so, but I wasn't, I wasn't trying that hard. Your supervisor at Berkeley was uh, Donald Sarazen, right? That's correct. Yeah. He was a giant in operator theory and Hardy spaces. Yeah. So that was when the whole Hardy space world was really hitting, you know, H infinity and stuff. So, and we did not have anything like scalable computations for doing H infinity problems. I mean, we were doing these little toy problems using interpolation theory and stuff like that. So it was clear to me something fundamental had to be done there. Could we spend maybe just a couple of words about what are Hardy spaces and why they come into the picture at that time? What do they have to do with control? Uh, okay, so the, the way we were thinking about it then was you could think of LQG as H2 in the sense that the norm on the closed loop was, it's, it's all L2 stuff, but in the Hardy space language, that is H2, which means all H2 means is that L2 analytic in the right half plane um, in the frequency domain. But the shift was going from H2 to H infinity. But at the time, with you had H2, you had Riccati equations, you had scalable computations, and in H infinity, there was nothing. Really, I mean, so the, the initial stuff was very clunky and didn't scale. I mean, I remember in the late 70s, we were first doing some stuff at, at Honeywell using primitive versions of mu synthesis where you were doing H infinity. Things that would now take, well, part of it is computers, but the things that would now, you know, punch a button and it would come back instantly would take days. So you couldn't do anything big. And, you know, and I got, you know, I figured out how to do it with Riccati equations, but I would have eight Riccati equations for each iteration. I mean, it was horrible. It was horrible. So, you know, I, so I went to Saracen and I told him this was a frontier. He was, turns out to be the world expert at this frontier. And, you know, could I work on this? So I'd gotten to know him anyway. I'd taken his classes and we really got along and stuff. Um, but he wasn't sure. And the reason he wasn't sure was that, I admittedly said a lot of this was aerospace and a lot of that was military. And he decided that he could work with me provided I never, ever mentioned that motivation. And he said he didn't really care because the math was interesting enough on its own. You know, the math I was proposing to do and had a start on was interesting enough for him, but he, he didn't want to 
he didn't want to even think about the fact that this would be military because he thought that was just, I mean, he was the purest of the pure. In retrospect, I think I should have been more like him and not, not have been so compromising. You know, he was a terrific advisor, but, you know, not very hands-on in the sense that I would just kind of show him results and he'd go, oh, that's interesting. And, and, is this, and I would say, does this look right from your perspective? And yes, and stuff. We never wrote a paper together or never, I mean, he was, he was a great advisor, but, um, but I was pretty independent. So I mostly need somebody who understood what I was doing on the math end. And there weren't very many people at that time who did, right? Now it's kind of a lot of that's all standard. But at the time, there just wasn't were people in control theory um, that were into those methods. But they quickly grew, right? So, But the thing that was, it was a very exciting time. So it took me, I think I was seven years as a PhD student. But I only had three years in residency because I was almost never there. Because <laughs> um, I was mostly, I was commuting. And then in the, in the late seventies, early eighties, as H infinity started picking up, it was very exciting because the frontiers in, in control theory and the frontiers in non self adjoint operator theory were coincident. So I was going to mostly operator theory conferences and, and there was just a cast of characters there that were amazing. Gochberg, um, Kashalk, uh, again, I'll forget the, the names, but they were, pure mathematicians, but they were starting to get interested in, in applications. That was extremely exciting to be able to go and straddle this thing where I go to Honeywell and do real engineering. And then I would, you know, spend the rest of the time doing mostly pure, pure math and trying to bridge those two. So again, that was just luck. And so, but it was a perfect time for me because I had one foot in with the best controls group, you know, probably in the world at the time. And then the other foot was in, you know, pure math. And uh, I was able to go back and forth with very strong support from both sides. And the place I had no home would have been in academic control theory. There was just no place in the U.S. that I could do anything, right? So, but I, again, I was, I mean, that is so much luck. I was just, you know, incredibly, incredibly lucky. And also I realized a lot of that luck was... You know, I was American. I was a big, loud white boy. I, w I was not happy about that part of it. And so I really, at the time, said, you know, we've got to stop. We've got to stop having bullying be the main means of interactions in this community. I mean, that, you know, and stuff. So, again, you know, I was lucky that I could stand up to the bullies. But I realized not everybody had a honey wall behind their back so that they could thumb their nose at academia. I mean, there's all sorts of things that, again, were just so much lucky, but I thought were, were bad for the field. I thought the field was dominated by bullies. Um, it was. I mean, it was really bad. And I, I, I as much wanted to change that as to change the technical content. I mean, I wanted to... And the other thing was you mentioned this theory practice gap. I remember when I went to ACC in 76, this was the mantra, right? Theory practice gap. We had all this great new theory, but it wasn't being used in industry because the industrial engineers just weren't up to speed. And even there, I said, look, there's a theory practice gap, but you've got it backwards. We're doing theory that doesn't, is irrelevant to the real world. And so the engineers, why, you know, even if they learn it, they're not going to be able to do anything with it because it's crap, which, you know, went over can imagine. But that was right. And the thing we had to do was turn that question around. There was no question that modern control theory in state space was the future, but primarily for computation, not for problem formulation, right? And you really, the, this input-output view and the multivariable view really had to think about what does a closed-loop system look like? And then of course, you're going to use state space for computation, but we don't, it's not anything else than really for computation. And so at the time, I mean, it seems like a natural view now, but it was quite radical in the late seventies. And so that was what I was pushing. And again, I was in a perfect situation, you know, being able to go to Berkeley and work on just the pure math and then go to Honeywell and work with real engineers. And that's how you close the gap, right? You don't close it by making fun of the engineers, but also that was a time 
I think also a unique time, which doesn't exist anymore, where the engineers really didn't want to kill people. So robustness became a front burner issue because we were building planes that, that couldn't be flown by humans and you had to have robust control systems. And now the problem is killing people is like uh, entering some spreadsheet along with interest rates in, a, in corporate. And so you see these horrible situations now where uh, high, very avoidable crashes from you know, the power grid to the 737 MAX are happening, not because we don't have the technology to do it right, but because in some MBA lawyers' spreadsheets, it doesn't seem to be worth the trouble. And of course, they're wrong. I mean, that's proven, but, but still that's the style now. So the engineers don't run those companies anymore. They used to. So the climate has changed. So I was a perfect sweet spot where companies cared about not crashing airplanes and killing people. And so since you started your PhD with uh, Don Sarazon, I think there were huge developments, like starting from 1978. So I think I noted down that you had this idea of using the singular value decomposition in this context, and this surfaces in 1979, if I'm correct. Yeah. The thing was, people were trying to do multivariable control using the eigenvalues of the closed-loop system, and that clearly wasn't right. And they were trying to do things a little bit of time that clearly wasn't right. And so the right thing was obviously to shift to singular values and look at the singular values either of E to the AT instead of the eigenvalues of A or the singular values of the closed loop system. Of course, it quickly became clear that that was too conservative, but it provided an upper bound. And so that was the idea was to shift the singular values. And we had some hacks then that have disappeared now, but the idea was to try to design for multi-loop singular values and using sort of a, a hack on LQG. But that that's disappeared completely. I mean, everything from there disappeared, right? The all the you know, characteristic psi inverse Nyquist away, full eigen structure assignment, these things that were big themes in the 70s were gone by the early 80s. The early 80s also witnessed the, as you say, the birth of H-infinity theory. I think uh, his first paper, uh, Zames, was probably published in 1979 in a conference, yeah. I think in Allerton. That's right. Yeah, I don't remember exactly, but certainly, certainly Zames, within the engineering community, Zames was really the person who was pioneering the shift H-infinity. And so, again, very influential for me. It was serendipitous for me because... I knew that was where it was going, and so I was, you know, trying to get ready mathematically to work on that. But, uh, but Zames was the inspiration for that, and again, one of my absolute heroes. I'll try to place some context for the audience, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, essentially Zames realizes that you should be minimizing the sensitivity function with respect to this H-infinity norm, and that this could be solved using essentially interpolation theory of analytic functions. That's correct. And that was a really crucial insight. So that was certainly, but if I think about the influences on me, that was one of the biggest. And it's crazy to think that also in basically one year later, also the concept of the gap metric surfaces, right? Oh, yes, absolutely. So that's 1980. That opened a lot of, I mean, yes. Yeah, so that opened up a lot of stuff. One of the things I tried to do, always have tried to do, is don't work on anything anybody else can work on because there's always stuff left over that is not being treated. And I remember some of my collaborators at the time would get annoyed at me because I would have some new idea and I would just tell everybody. So one of my colleagues said, always called it Doyle's blabbing. He called it blabbing, where you would go and tell everybody your latest idea. And I said, yeah, but if someone else can work on it, then I don't have to. <laughs> and And... <laughs> no, but that's not how it works. I go, yeah, well, why not? Right. Anyway, so um, so the thing that was just crushing at the time was this computation was just not scalable. So we were trying to do H infinity and mu synthesis type designs in the late 70s. And it was just a nightmare computationally. Now it was okay. If what you were just doing was, you know, generating a counterexample or something, then it's okay. But if you're trying to have something be a tool 
for real engineers to use. They can't have every time they push the return key waiting for a week, right? That's just, not, I mean, where now it's like milliseconds, but the computation, I mean, it was clear to me that we had to go back to state space for computation. So in the early 80s, that was what I focused on was how to do all the computation in state space. And that was what my thesis was on. Still horribly clunky, but it was at least polynomial. So we, we didn't even know if it was polynomial time in the multivariable case. And we, we pretty much were sure it was, but it wasn't clear. And so all my thesis did was say it was polynomial time, but the polynomial was pretty horrible. So it was after that that we actually, you know, finally converged on the two Riccatius equations with Glover. So essentially, you proved that H infinity was a tractable problem, at least in principle. At least in principle. That was my thesis. But still, there were details to be filled. Yeah. And that's exactly what you focus on between 1984 and 1989. Is that correct? Not really, actually. That's kind of also ironic. I was more f focused on the mu side, like real parameters, how to just deal with scalable ways of dealing with uncertainties in big systems. And again, not big like we talk about now. It would be just like a, you know, an airplane, but not loop at a time. So just trying to get out of this loop at a time, how to think about those things. Um, so, and, and Keith was also not, Keith and I were both sort of working on this and he was my main collaborator then. And I would spend every summer, you know, I've spent a month every summer in Cambridge and again, how lucky was I? We're of course talking about Keith Glover, another legendary figure in control, pioneer in the field of robust control. How did you get to know each other? I think just reputation. And I think he came to one of the workshops I'd put together and I just got to know him. And he was, he was clearly a singularity for me in the sense that I was, I, he knew engineering really well. It was interesting because he was more, more of an engineer than the sort of the main academic control theorists, but also he was a better mathematician. So he was both. And so we hit it off, I think, really, really well. But we were not working on H infinity together. Um, I mean, we were, I mean, the gap metric is around then. We were trying to reconcile a lot of these robustness measures, right? And uh, also we figured, based on my thesis, it was obviously polynomial time, it was obviously could be done with Riccati equations. There was just too many of them. And I mean, th again, the talent level still in control theory was quite high. They were just doing stupid problems. So the question, I thought that we were both certain that based on what we had done so far, this would be mopped up in no time. Um, and then it wasn't, you know, and here's maybe 87 it was or something. And, and I'm, you know, sitting with him in Cambridge and we'd working on something else. I didn't even remember what it was. And we had a week to go. He said, you know, no one's really cracked this H infinity problem. So we said, okay, let's, let's really work on it for a week. So we worked on it for a week and got the basic, the basic two Riccati equation solutions out, but we didn't have a, the separation theorem was very clunky. It never got perfect, but it was even worse. But here's the miracle again. I go back to Minneapolis and I show Kurganiker what we've gotten. And he goes, I mean, he was just like his jaw dropped because he said, we've been working on the state feedback case. And we get the same, roughly the same kind of Riccati equations you're getting. So we're thinking, uh, so we knew there had to be a separation theorem, but it was a very weird one. And so we didn't understand how to do it. And then because of Kurganiker, we, we did, right? So it was really this perfect storm almost of, you know, Kurganiker in Minneapolis, he was at the University of Minnesota. I went, you know, and he, he had a piece of it. Bruce Francis had a piece of it. So then it was just a matter of us all getting together and cleaning it up. You know, in a way we did, but so DGKF, and there were several other papers leading up to DGKF, but, um, but we sort of cleaned that up in the sense of getting it to two Riccati equations, understanding that you, it was stupid to try to get the aptal, the actual H infinity optimal, which you'd wanted to get as something a little bit above that and, and use these integral log debt integral formulas as your objective. So it took a while to sort that all out, but, but it, it, it was, again, it was this dream team for me of people who were, I just felt like I'm, I was just in a dream because I always, always felt like I was the stupidest guy in the room. And that was so fun. So I, I again, the, the luck there is just, you know, I was just incredibly lucky to have this Honeywell plus foreign academics 
and then a few coming up like like promote andy packard uh and so i just again incredibly lucky and so we're obviously talking about state space solutions to standard h2 and h infinity control problems this is a paper that as you mentioned together with Keith Glover, Kagonekar, and Francis, you published on the IEEE transactions. This deservedly got the Axel Beer world because essentially it gave a full solution to the H-infinity problem. And for me, what is funny is that it basically relies on a purely state space approach, or at least you use many tricks that are have to do with that. So completing the square and you know linking those tools with uh, frequency domain inequalities, spectral factorizations. So there's essentially a lot of machinery that fuses itself into a single paper. And um, I was wondering whether, how did it all come up? Did you guys like meet in a single place and brainstorm for a week or something? Or how did the paper actually came together? Um, well, no, I was no, not together in the sense that I was, I was working with all three of them. And they all knew each other, but the actual, you know, sit down and, and work on it together kind of thing was really pairwise. So it started with Keith and then with Promote, and then we brought Bruce in. Every one of those people had their own particular insights that were crucial. And then I was sort of the glue, which in retrospect was a terrible idea. Um, but, uh, but I was sort of the glue. And so it kind of evolved that way, not, and so I was kind of the center of a team. And I, I think I was good at starting things, but then very bad at finishing. And I've always been that way. I'm just not a, I'm not a good finisher. Uh, so I have good ideas, but I, I make a lot of mistakes. And so I'm best when someone else finishes things. So, uh, in my more recent publications, I've, I've tried to get on the team, someone who would also, I just started to understand my own limitations better. And so I heard that comments from an undisclosed person in the field, this has been dubbed as the worst paper in control theory, essentially because before this paper, in order to talk about robust control theory, one really had to know really hardcore math. And it, this made it a very exclusive club. But after this paper, it was sufficient to set up a couple of Riccati equations to solve an H infinity problem. Yeah, I, I guess we're not going to disclose who said that, but I, <laughs> I think there's two senses in which that was meant. One was, yes, that the heavy math needed kept out the riffraff in someone's opinion. And I, I'm sympathetic to that. I think the, up until then, it was very exciting because we could justify going to all these operator theory conferences and hanging out with all these fabulous mathematicians because we didn't have a purely control theoretic version of the problem like just Riccati equations just sum of squares just you know complete the square just all the stuff that we knew from basically from h2 right although i think the dgkf had some innovations even in the h2 case about thinking about these problems so so i think that was one problem with the paper which was that it it shifted the center of gravity. The other thing I think, I mean, there's a several things. I think the other thing was H and I mean, that's the, my most cited paper, right? And I think one of the criticisms that the undisclosed person was leveling was H infinity was just overrated. In, in what sense? Why H infinity? It was convenient because you could think things in the frequency domain, right? And so you preserved the frequency domain thinking that classical people liked, but you could do all the things with Riccati equations. So the state space people liked it, but it wasn't clear that it was actually a good norm. Now, I think it's a great norm for the purpose of bridging classical and modern. Okay. But it doesn't, it's not good for big systems, uh, which is one of the things we're trying to fix now. And there was, you know, there was L1, there and arguably as good or better a way of thinking about a lot of systems and i think it got sidelined a bit because it was coming along at the same time that this h infinity stuff was going and i 
I'm trying to revive that whole L1 world now because I think for big systems, for like power grids and stuff like that, H-infinity is entirely inappropriate. And L1 and related norms, I think, are much better. And so we're really trying to kind of almost revive the L1 world, although all the L1 people have moved on to doing completely other things. So there isn't an L1 world to be revived. So we're just trying to start over in some sense. But But I thought that was a very legitimate complaint, that L1 didn't get, it didn't become as central as it should have been, uh, partly because H infinity was a, was a bigger distraction than it should have been. Um, but there's a third reason why that was a bad paper. It was a bad paper. So, uh, I tried to do all sorts of clever innovations in how the, it was laid out how the theorems, I mean, I don't know what I was talking, thinking about, but I, I did a whole bunch of stupid things. And uh, because I was the glue, I could sort of take control of the kind of what the final version looked like. And I think it was appalling to my co-authors, but it was like too big a fight. I, I, it, wasn't, I, I, it wasn't a fight so much. It's just that, I don't know, I was at the center of it and I was, I was driving it. And I just, it, it's just a bad paper and it's all my fault. So that's another thing about it. And, and um, I, I may have mentioned to you that Andy Packard said one time that he was the only person who's ever read the whole paper, <laughs> including the co-authors. <laughs> <laughs> and no one argued with him. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to not like that paper. I mean, the one reason to like that paper is the two Riccati equations. I mean, there's no question that that was an enormous breakthrough at the time. But almost everything else was bad, and and it's and everything else was my fault. So, I I and I wish, yeah, I wish I'd been less creative. Because <laughs> sometimes when you're very very creative, you're just wrong. And so there's there's a lot of bad stuff in that paper. So that's I think um, maybe t airing too much dirty laundry. But um, but then I think uh, subsequently, you know, my students cleaned it up a lot. So you'll have, you know, there's books that are later, like uh, Dalton and Paganini and Kem and Zhao and various people wrote books and went through it again. And there was stuff, I mean, it was, it was clearly a good differential game problem. So you could think of it from that point of view. So I think it got cleaned up, but DG Kef was a mess. And it's not clear anybody read. I mean, I, I, in my class on robust control, I tell people do not read this paper. Uh, it's, it's just awful. Let me mention that, of course, there will be links to all the papers that we've mentioned so far in the description. I just want to add something about what you were referring to, uh, so the L1 business, as well as hinting towards uh, large systems. So this will be the topic of our next discussion, so the shift of focus towards architectures and large-scale systems. But something that I wanted to add concerns a sort of resurgence of interest in robust control. And this has been revived by uh, what you call uh, system level synthesis. So this is another paper that has won an Axelby Award in 2021. This is with uh, Yuxiang Wang and Nikolai Matney, if I'm correct. That's correct. And that's essentially your new take on how to fix uh, H-infinity, but in the context of potentially large-scale distributed, also time-distributed systems. Yeah, actually, for me, I think SLS is the sing. I mean, if I were to say one single thing that I've ever worked on was the most significant, I would say it's that. And I think by a lot, because in retrospect, everything I did in H in in robust control was almost obvious in retrospect, in the sense that um, it was incremental. It was incremental, but it was incremental in pulling together things that were that seemed distant but weren't. This gap was artificial. It was artificial. It was created by the theorists who were just not listening. So in retrospect, robust control was an almost obvious path if you were in my situation. That's why I said I was lucky more than anything else. I was in the right place at the right time, around the right people. And, uh, and I listened. People might be shocked at that because I talk so much, but, but I, I listened to those people around me. SLS just came completely out of the blue. And so I'll, obviously I want to, you know, that's a separate topic, but and it was a side effect of my interest in architecture. 
and what happened there was once we had a like what looked like a coherent starting of a coherent theory of architecture always led us to the lowest layer sort of reflex layers that were completely intractable um, since Witzenhausen. So we ran into the Witzenhausen nightmare. And in retrospect, we were just asking the wrong question. <laughs> Again, it was one of the things where we just had to, had to just, once we asked the right question. And, and I sort of posed the right question, but I was wildly wrong about what the answer was going to look like. So fortunately, my, again, I'm lucky to have students that are way smarter than me. So they came back and said, no, this is, this is how it should work. And I said, it can't be, you know, it can't be that simple. And, and so I was shocked, but it is. And so I think the SLS is another SLS and architecture together is in ways a much more exciting development, even than robust control, robust control should have been a lot more obvious than it was. You're serving me a great assist for advertising our next conversation. This will be entirely about this topic, so architectures. And ideally, I'd like to have another episode with your students on SLS alone, because I think it deserves uh, being explored in a deeper conversation just dedicated to that. Yeah, and I think and, and absolutely um, my students are the experts and not me. I mean, collectively, they are the experts. And, and I'm, I'm kind of still focusing on the architecture in which SLS plays an, a, a really central role, but not the, not the only role. And, uh, and I've gotten really interested in non-engineering applications, partly because you know, all the big schools in the field have my students, and they're working on this, right? And so I want to stay out of their way, but also, frankly, they're better than me. And so if they decide to do something, I, you know, the best thing for me is to get out of their way. And so again, I've been very, I mean, in, again, incredibly lucky to have the students that I've had. They're just, you know, astonishingly lucky. And, and now they're at all the, I mean, almost every top university that has any kind of controls activity uh, has a, st a student of mine. And so, so that, that means I have to, to stay relevant, I have to, you know, look for new frontiers where there, there are gaps and there's so many, so that's not hard, but, but they're, I'm focusing less on engineering now, not because I don't think it's interesting, but that, you know, my, again, my students are ahead of me in almost all the areas of engineering. So. I have actually a set of questions that are unrelated to control. I'll ask you some of these in this episode and some of these in the future episodes. So one of these questions is a bit provocative, but you know, there's always been a tension in control um, as to how do we actually interpret control itself? So, you know, for Wiener, we could argue that control was almost, or, you know, systems were machines that are processing information, whereas maybe for people like Willems, uh, control would be interaction. I know that this is quite provocative, but I'm wondering what are your thoughts on this? Well, I think, I think they all had certain insights um, that were right. And so I remember in, I think, 1981, NATO organized a lecture tour of Europe. And the, the two people I spent most time with were, were Wanham, or sorry, well, Wanham was on the thing, but uh, Willems and Zames. So it was Willems, Zames, Wanham, McFarlane, and me. Uh, and so, and I was a graduate student, although I was, I was in my late twenties. So I was not that young, but, but it was really bizarre for me. I was in my twenties and everybody else was in their fifties and sixties. And so we were traveling around Europe. It was really fun. But one of the funnest things was having a debate with Willems and, uh, and Zames about what was more fundamental, the notion of uncertainty or the notion of state. And I was on the both sides, like <laughs> they're equally important, but I think this has been going on for a while. And I think that's one of the reasons why I've shifted to thinking about the problem of architecture, which we'll talk about next time. But the idea is that when we look at the architecture of the internet or the power grid or the bacterial cell or our bodies or societies or supply chains, you know, all these things that we see, these big systems. They have very complex architectures for which we do not have a theory for the whole thing. We have fragments, we have computing, we have communications, we have control. And then we have the sort of physics of the substrate that we're you know, building, whether it's the internet or the power grid. Okay. So each of those areas 
has a systems theory associated with it. So you can start from any one of those and try to go after architecture and, and except for physics, which has no architecture at all. The other three all have notions of architecture. So you could think of the geniuses of the 20th century, Turing, Shannon, Bode, as all being architects from, but from a narrow perspective. And then the dominant thing in science comes out of physics, which is network science and complexity science. And there's no architecture there at all. You know, it makes the 70s control theory look, you know, like, you know, perfect, right? I mean, it's really a mess. So what I began to realize was the, if we want an integrated theory of computing, communication, control, and physics, control is going to have to do that because control theory is the only starting point that includes the physical dynamics and includes computation and communication naturally. Whereas the theories of computing and communication don't include feedback very effectively or uncertainty. So the kind of uncertainty, uncertainty in the physics. So we want to think about, we have uncertainty in the physics. We want to build systems that are integrated and make extensive use of communication and computing. But the ultimate thing is almost always control. And that's certainly the case for biology. So if you want to go after architecture and biology, that's how you must do it. But again, this is a long conversation, but the idea is that control theory as it existed, you know, 10 years ago, simply couldn't take this problem on either. Even though it's, it's the right place to ask the questions, we didn't have the tools. And SLS was the most important thing to develop. Once you have that, then it opens up an enormous amount. And the reason for that is subtle and stuff, but it's, uh, but, um, so I think, if we're going to have a theory of system architecture, control theory has got to play a big role and I think should be at least one of the main sources. And right now it isn't. So right now control engineers and control theorists build little boxes in big systems that someone else designed. And those someone else's don't have any theory. It's all ad hoc. And so we get incredibly brilliant, fantastic innovations that have catastrophic fragilities. So robust architecture is really, I think, the challenge of our age. I think we need all hands on deck for it because we're building increasingly fragile systems that are increasingly pervasive. And, uh, and I think that's a you know, recipe for disaster. And people worry about AI. I think AI is the tip of the iceberg, but it's an important one. So, so I think that's a big conversation. I'm very, very excited to talk about this uh, in the next episode. Maybe in closing, I had one last question that we didn't address. So we mentioned that even today, there's a huge gap between academia and the real world of engineering, if you want, but in a different way with respect to what you experienced, at least, you know, between the 70s and, and the 80s, all the way to the 90s. And I was wondering, how do we fix that? Well, I think, again, the big challenge, again, I... The big challenge, I think, is architecture. And if you look at the architectures that dominate our lives, you know, burning fossil fuels to make electricity, all the way to the internet, there is no theory in any of that. And I know the internet architects. I mean, I hung out with those people 20 years ago, right, when I was trying to understand the internet. And they are geniuses. So what you have is you have architecture being done by artistic geniuses, but you inevitably are going to solve uh, a proximal problem and uh, neglect robustness. And that's what happened. I mean, people don't remember, but in the 80s, the entire internet collapsed because of a, a feedback control problem that in some sense, in retrospect, was kind of trivial. But the, these artistic geniuses, and I, you know, no question, these are artistic geniuses. But then what happens is we get our whole world designed by artistic geniuses. And you can think of a few of them that are prominent in the, you know, in the media now, you know, everybody in Silicon Valley, who's a, you know, giga billionaire, all started as basic artistic geniuses that came up with platforms, came up with architectures that made them extremely rich. And it just led to just nightmares, um, you know, for the mental health of adolescents, particularly girls. I mean, we have just, we have cascading failures in our power grid that are getting worse. And then we have societies that are just broken 
in so many ways. And so we, we, because we don't think about robustness in these architectures, we keep making the same mistakes over and over again. And why shouldn't we? I mean, if you're, if you're a Silicon Valley, you know, entrepreneur, you want, and our whole financial situation is short term, you're going to make exactly the kind of mistakes that we tried to head off in the seventies. Well, very excited to, to talk about this in, in the next episode. I think this brings us to the end of this first chunk of our discussion. Thank you so much for joining us, John. Thank you. And I, I wish I was more succinct, but hopefully people will have the patience to kind of wade through the verbiage and, and get something out of it. But thank you. Thank you for listening. I hope you liked the show today. If you enjoyed the podcast, please consider giving us five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow us on Spotify, support on Patreon or PayPal, and connect with us on social media platforms. See you next time.